the fear of God and listen to the Holy Gospel, a chapter from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the evangelist, apostle, and pure disciple. May his blessing From the son of our teacher David, the prophet and the king, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. I love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you, in the presence of the sons of men. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, O Lord God, Savior and the King of our soul, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, glory be to you. say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And the Lord said to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by all her children.
name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today being the second week of the new year, should really be the reading of the second Sunday of Tut. But because when we celebrated Nehruz, we celebrated it on the Sunday, so that takes precedence because it's a feast. And so today we're reading the first reading of Tut, the first Sunday of Tut. And then the second will be offset by a week and the third and the fourth and so on. And today's reading is presented by the church to us to give us some real fruitful thought about the new year. And what is it that we should be focusing on the new year? If we cast our minds back at the end of the year, the church was talking to us and giving us readings about the signs of times and repentance and so on and so forth. Now that we started the new year, the reading is focused on how should we use this new year? What should we be looking to apply in this new year? What should we be getting out of it? And so the reading is at the point in time where our Lord Jesus Christ had started his ministry already. He was performing miracles, the miracle of raising the son of the widow of Nain. He was already healing people. The man with the withered hand was healed on the Sabbath. And at the same time, St. John the Baptist was in prison. And he was in prison because this was the time where Herod wanted to marry really his sister-in-law, who was divorced from his brother, but was still his sister-in-law, Herodias. And St. John the Baptist condemned him. So what did Herod do? He put him in jail. So if we kind of look at that sequence, and then from today's reading where our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about John the Baptist, and gives him a lot of gratification. And then further beyond that, he talks to those that are present in terms of some of these sayings regarding children in the marketplace and then ends with wisdom. What does this all mean and what's the church trying to tell us and how does this relate to the new year? So let's delve into that. We ask God to give us wisdom to be able to understand his word and guidance and grace through his Holy Spirit to teach us and learn how to best utilize this new year. So if we look at as we say, John the Baptist was in prison at that point in time. And the reading starts off where there was two disciples that John sent to ask Jesus if he was the Messiah or not. John here wasn't trying to confirm if our Lord Jesus Christ was the Messiah or not. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew that when he baptized him. But what he was trying to do is to start teaching all those that were following him. You can imagine that he's in prison, and the prison would have been inundated with his followers, not just his disciples, but those that followed him. And what he's trying, starting to do is shift the focus. As he said, he, referring to Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. So he's starting to shift that focus away from him and send it towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the intention of him sending the disciples. And as you can imagine, the crowd around the jail, if they saw two disciples walking away, they're bound to follow them to see what they're going to go do. And so I went to Jesus and had that conversation with him. And so people started to listen to Jesus and move towards Jesus, including St. John's disciples, rather than continue to be preoccupied with St. John. And as such, our Lord gives him the greatest honor. He doesn't do it while the two disciples are there, that on the way back to John. He does it after. And he says that St. John is the greatest among those born. The greatest. What a statement to make. Why the greatest? Well, not only was he the forerunner leading the way before Christ, but the fact that he didn't let his ministry get to him as someone that was superior and his focus was Christ, to bring those he was ministering to to Christ. That humility set him as great. And furthermore, the way he lived he was living in the bush or in the desert, eating wild locusts and honey. He wasn't after worldly desires and worldly riches and accolades and repayments in terms of his service. But in the same verse, he says also, 
but the smallest of these is greater than St. John. The Lord, you just said that he's the greatest, and then you say the smallest of these. Who's the smallest of these? Our church fathers tell us that there's two things that we need to take from this verse to understand. The first is that Jesus Christ, as we know, was six months younger than St. John because when St. Mary was visited by the Archangel Gabriel, he already told her that her cousin Elizabeth, was, who was barren, was pregnant with St. John, who was six months. And so there's a symbolism there that even though St. John was the forerunner, he's the older, but the smaller one, being Jesus, was the greatest. He's the King of kings and lords of lords. But there's also another beautiful interpretation where it tells us that St. John essentially was the last old prophet testament. The, I got that mixed around. The last Old Testament prophet, more precisely. The last Old Testament prophet. Because he was here preaching the way before the salvation, before our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. And so our beautiful church fathers tell us that anyone that was before St. John, even though he was the greatest of those in the Old Testament, had not only the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they were also gifted with the Holy Spirit and also were unified with God through the Holy Eucharist. And that gives them that unification with God more than any of the Old Testament prophets or anyone that lived in the Old Testament because all they had was burnt sacrifices. Okay. So we understand why our Lord is giving St. John such grace and such honor. But then we get to these verses around where our Lord is talking about kids in the marketplace and they were singing and no one danced and they were mourning and no one wept. And what does that all have to do with this story on St. John? And by the way, another reason this gospel is read is that we also celebrate the martyrdom of St. John on the 2nd of Tut. So it's always read close to his martyrdom. But what our Lord Jesus Christ was saying here is that in the, in the gospel itself, he said it to them plainly. He said that you had St. John come to you and you said he's got a demon because he doesn't eat and he doesn't drink and he doesn't do what we do. And then the Son of Man came drinking and eating and sitting with people and you say that um, he's a friend of tax collectors and a sinner. So what our Lord is telling them is that you as the teachers of Israel who know the scriptures off by heart and supposed to be leading the people, how could you be so hypocritical when someone so humble comes and tries to preach a path of repentance and then when someone comes to grant you salvation, you reject both accounts. This way you're not happy and that way you're not happy. And why aren't you happy? The reason that Jesus points out the not happy comes in the last verse where he talks about wisdom. And he says, but wisdom is justified by her children. Wisdom is justified by her children. What does that mean, wisdom is justified by her children? Obviously, you characterize someone by their family. So if someone is born of this family, they have certain characters because they grew up in this particular household. Or another saying is an apple doesn't fall far from its tree. We know the fruit by its tree. And what the Lord is pointing out here is that those that think that they are the wisest, that they are the most intellectually appropriated with the actual Torah and the understanding of the Mosaic law, are the ones that are showing the fruit that is the least in terms of bearing virtues. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that from their knowledge of the Mosaic law, they heartened their hearts against repentance with John. They said there's no way someone 
like that, that looks like that, that dresses like that, that eats like that, is going to be coming from God. We expect our Messiah to come as a triumphant king and save us from the Romans who were invading at that point in time. And then when Jesus came to offer them salvation, St. John was offering forgiveness of sins to prepare the way, Jesus was offering them salvation. And they said, that can't be the Christ, that can't be the Messiah, because he's sitting with tax collectors and sinners. Again, we're expecting a king to come. So their knowledge caused their mind and their hearts to be hardened. Furthermore, their application of their knowledge was in their aspiration to have an earthly reward. Why an earthly reward? They wanted to be pleasing in front of people and not focused in terms of being pleasing in front of God. And we see that in terms of, again, when Jesus went to the temple and turned the money tables, they were supposed to be holding the temple as the holiest of holies in all stages of the temple, but they turned it into a den. They were after their own vanity in terms of how people saw them at church, and we know the, the, the parable around the tax collector and the Pharisee that entered into the church, and the tax collector was at the back beating his chest saying, God, forgive me, a sinner. And the Pharisee was at the front in all his glory and might saying, God, at least I'm not like that person at the back. Their focus was on their reward here, not their reward there. And so that describes for us this fruit of wisdom, the children of wisdom. The children of wisdom here is that we need to look at the two aspects and learn from the failures of the Pharisees such that we can take that as a lesson in terms of our spiritual struggle. So the first failure that they had was that essentially they were not able to have the salvation of heaven as their ultimate aim and their ultimate goal. They had the reward that they wanted here on earth. They wanted to see that the reward was given to them here on earth. And that blinded them and hardened their minds and hardened their heart based on relying on their ununderstanding rather than opening the ears and opening their eyes, as we say in the litany of the gospel. And as was said in the gospel as well. So we need to be able to open our eyes and open our ears, not in terms of what we want to achieve here. Whatever we want to achieve here, great to have ambitions, great to have plans, and we should all have ambitions and plans. But don't lose sight of the ultimate aim, which is the kingdom of heaven. The second area that they failed in is that they let their pride get in the way. I know more than you. I understand more than you. I'm more experienced than you. I am anointed, and so I know better than you. And that got in their way. Got in their way in terms of understanding the message of repentance for, from St. John the Baptist and the message of salvation from, Saint, uh, from our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. So much so that others who were listening were actually following in droves St. John the Baptist to get that, get that repentance and Jesus to get that salvation. They opened the ears and opened their eyes. Perhaps you'll say that they were simple. It could be. But nonetheless, it's through that simplicity and humility that they had, that's where the word was able to get into their heart. So what the church is teaching us today in terms of the first gospel of Tut on Sunday is that as we start the year, we need to also be seeking for this fruit of wisdom. We need to make sure that the children of wisdom in our life is these two main things. Focusing on the salvation of Lord Lord and being humble to be able to hear it. And this is in all aspects of our life. I'll tell you a little story that resonated with me when I heard it in relation to this verse where, and this is a true story. This is a young man who went to Russia to study. And uh, his parents paid all his fees and, and uh, he got into a great course. And part of that course was they had to do a physics subject. And so the first day in the physics lecture, 
the lecturer is talking about physics and then phenomena, the natural phenomena that make up the subject that they're going to study. And at that point in time, being communist Russia, the lecturer went out of his way to make a point, and he said, everything that we're going to study today has a reason, and that reason is based on nature. It's not based on any belief that you've got. And I don't care if you're Christian, if you're Hindu, if you're Buddhist, if you're whatever, there is no God. This is all explained through the text. And so this particular young man heard this and kind of kept it in his heart. But this lecturer didn't stop there. Every lecture, he would remind them again and got to the point where he was really slandering those that believed or had a belief. This particular student got to a point where he felt that this lecturer was essentially crucifying his Christ again. So he put his hand up and he said to him, so I understand your belief, but I want to let you know I'm a Christian and what you're saying is really dishonoring my belief. I appreciate what you're saying, and I appreciate your belief, but please, this slandering that you're doing every lecture, if you can stop it, I'd really appreciate it. The lecturer from that day onwards made it his mission to make an example of this student in every lecture or tutorial or exam. He gave him the hardest time possible he used to embarrass him in front of all the students. Essentially bullying. Later that uh, semester, the student found that the lecturer wasn't coming for over two weeks. And so he went to the faculty and asked, where is this lecturer? And they said, well, look, he's got um, some family issues. He's got a son, and his son is extremely unwell, and uh, we're all hoping that his son gets better, but at this point in time, he's, dis he's, uh, he's disposed. He's not going to be contactable. You can't contact him. The student made it an effort or kind of made a conscious decision to go visit him and try to at least comfort him. And he asked other students, but no one would go with him because they all feared this lecture. So he went on his own, even though this is the guy that was bullying him for I don't know how many weeks. And he went and he saw him at the hospital and he said to him, I heard and I came to visit you and I just wanted to pass on my best wishes for your son. And so they started the conversation. And where they got to was essentially the lecturer was saying that his son had had all the scans, had all the tests, nothing that the doctors could possibly do was going to return his son to him. He was at the lowest point in his life, and he was desperate for any way that he can bring his son back to health. And so our friend said to him, I know your belief and I respect your belief, but my belief is Christ. And usually what we do in these instances is we pray. Do you mind if I pray? And the lecturer said, no, I don't mind. And he actually stood next to him while he was praying next to his son's bed. A week or so later, his son did get better. And the lecturer was back at the university. And he made it a point to go see that, that student one-on-one. -on -one. And he told him about a vision that his son had had in his sickness. And it was only after that vision, like, we don't know what the vision was, but we know it was a vision. And it was after the prayer, and it was only after that vision that his son was made well. And he asked him, you, he, he said to him, you saved my son with that prayer. And even though I had a hardened heart, I need to know who is it that you're praying to what is this prayer? How did it heal my son? Please teach me about your Christ. And so it's a beautiful real-life story that brings us back to this hardening of hearts and hardening of minds. He was the lecturer. He thought he knew better. He studied all the texts. He knew that everything in physics was a natural phenomena. He used his brain and not his heart. And even where he had the heart, he believed 
that there was no God. He hardened it up until the point where he was at his last tether and had no other way. And God manifested his glory through a youth that did something as simple as pray. So we too, in this year, as we start the year, let's focus on the fruits of our tree of wisdom, the children of our tree of wisdom. Be vigilant, focus on salvation, and soften your heart, not to be proud, but to listen to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. May our Lord Jesus Christ dominate our hearts as our true and triumphant King. Grant us wisdom to prepare our path this year in the hope and the focus of the eternal salvation to be united with our groom, our Lord Jesus Christ, in his second coming. And glory be to God forevermore.